Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Melbourne Athletic Development Podcast. Today, we're very lucky to be joined by Adrian Mott. Adrian, thank you for joining us. Thanks, John. Lovely to be here. Can you give us a little bit of a background about who you are and a little bit about your journey um, and what you do? Yeah, I guess a uh, high performance coach and I guess I've probably spent most of my professional career working in cricket, more specifically as a physical performance manager for the Victorian cricket team. Uh, had that role for 12 years. Because it's Re- 12 years. Recently just uh, uh, resigned uh, and finished. Jack up. asked me before this because I said, you know, we're, we're, we're mates from athletics days and I said, um, he said, oh, what's, what's Adrian's background? I said, oh, he's a Cricket Victoria, I think, for about 10 years. So 12, it's, it's a long time. 12, and then I was actually working within Cricket Victoria for 17 years. Really? So I started there at the age of 21. Mm. Um, I was then running the strength and conditioning department for the Coburg Tigers. Yep. We were then aligned with Richmond Reserves. Yes, yeah, I remember that, yeah. yeah. Our head coach was the player development, development manager for Victorian Cricket. Andy Collins, yes, who's now assistant coach at one of the AFL clubs. Yeah, we had a lot of success there at Coburg, didn't he? Very much so. So two years I was there. So he goes, we need a sprint coach. And I'm talking a long time ago now, but around 2008, sprint training wasn't as well renowned as what it is these days. So I was in a kind of minority and got lucky. So And maybe give people some background. You obviously have a sprint background. Do you want to tell people a little bit about your, and I'm sure you yeah, so it's a long time ago now, but you were quite successful at lots of levels. Yeah, so I like to call myself. Growing up, I enjoyed playing AFL footy. I just happened to be a better runner <laughs> than I was a footballer. So I um, ended up taking up sprinting and ended up becoming a national level sprinter. Um, gave it my all to try and get that international level. Didn't quite work out, which is fine. Um, so national level sprinter, and I think the well, foundation. You got to 10 4, didn't you? Yeah, 10.43 was my quicket. So. I was in generally the national squads, in the relay squads, generally in the B team for the 4 by 100 meter relay. Um, gave it everything I had, but didn't quite eventuate. But I think we'll probably more discuss it in more depth later on, I dare say. But certainly put me in good stead from a professional point of view because without the running and the sprinting background, and like I mentioned, that's how I got my role as leading the yeah. strength and conditioning department for Coburg Tigers at the age of 21. Mm. Um, and then from that, I started working as sprint coach for the Victorian cricket team. From that, just kind of grew. And, and was that just naturally someone reached out and said, do you want to help out with cricket? Like, how did that eventuate that that's jumped from? Well, that was the link. Okay. So I got my first breakthrough. I was working in the gym floor at Ascot Vale Gym. Yep. Uh, and they said, we, Andy Collins was looking for a head fitness coach. He wants someone with a sprint background. Can you do it? And I've never met him. I said, <laughs> sure. Of course I can. <laughs> I would love to. So I remember uh, I finally met him on the first day of training at preseason. Again, the along with Richmond in these days and rocked up at Hunt Road facilities at training on a Monday around 5 p.m. And pre-season squad, there was around 75 people. And okay. first I had to go out and find two assistants. I got two of my friends with me from university um, to be my assistant strength and conditioning coaches, yeah. which was great fun. Um, and then I, being then looking around, I really I was very confident as a 21-year-old. And I think the average age of the squad would have been maybe 25 and there I am barking instructions at them and we did our fitness testing, whatever protocol I made up on that day and I think I had a crack at them at the end of that session and I think Andy Collins back then was a very straight down the line sort of coach and he saw me do that and I think I won him over there and then. Yeah. That's cool. Um, So that's how I got the link into cricket. They were very under-resourced in that generation so they needed a sprint coach. Um, He put me in contact with the then head strength and conditioning coach for Victorian cricket. Um, I remember I rocked up and, again, being a national level sprinter, we used to, training, we used to use my little camcorder um, and just camcorder doing block starts or high speed running or max for loss work, whatever it may be, um, use that and feedback. And so I took that with me in my first session. I started video recording all these Australian cricketers who I loved watching on TV. And then I'd go home and I'd upload it um, onto Windows Media Player. <laughs> I'd then have to go frame by frame. I'd then have to pause it, have to crop it and put it in Microsoft Paint. And then from Microsoft Paint, I would then have to draw little diagrams of what Angles, I was specifically lines. looking at was yeah, yeah. ground contact position, uh, push off as well, front on and side on, get my little color-coded system, circles. And then from that, I'd then copy that into Excel. And then from Excel, then gave a full explanation of what I meant and areas of strength, areas of deficiencies, and how to transfer that into the gym. 
And that was how I first did my full biomechanical analysis of these team sport athletes, I suppose. And that's how I kind of got prominent and that's how I got my roles in my professional life. And that kind of snowballed from there, which is really great. Yeah. And next it's, thing, yeah. It's changed a lot, hasn't it? Obviously now it's something <laughs> that dreams. I know that I did ask you about <laughs> that I put in our sort of three questions is, you know, this idea of technology and where that sits. So it sounds like, you know, you come from a time when I've done a lot of that myself where you're under-resourced and you're literally doing it step by step. The question that, I, you know, makes me think of is, do you think that having that background and being able to do that is a skill that maybe some of the coaches now aren't necessarily aware of? And does it, do you think it gives you a strength in some ways that you actually have some of those foundational ideas? I think it does because these days the AI and the technology available can give you the information just right in front of you there and then instantly. But I feel like without the technology, you need to know specifically what you're looking for and how you're going to go about finding that. Well, I'll give you a funny story. Oh, actually, the other thing I was just going to say is even the simple fact of you having to spend so much time looking at a picture as you draw in the angles, there's probably a lot of the things that you picked up and you, you pay much more nuanced attention to things that you wouldn't otherwise do if you were just doing it on an app these days where it does it for you. So I also wonder how much that also builds up that, say, visual acuity of your ability to see things because as you look at it more, you start to, I don't know, better, build a better visual representation of it in your head. Yeah, I think it does. And you see, I mentioned kinograms before, but you feel like also John being a very sprint coach, highly successful yeah. sprint coach and a sprinter, you kind of now just look at someone move at varying velocities and you can break them down and segmentize each part of their gait in mm. your mind there and then without the need of a kinogram to look the flow. Mm. Yes, that helps when you're talking to the athletes from a presentation point of view, but from an internal perspective, looking at the eye, you know what you can see, you know what but you it's, found. It's and- really you say that because I feel like sometimes I actually see more in real time than I do slowing it down. Um, and I, I think it's just a practice thing, but I actually find that you just – watch people run so much you can actually see what they've done and you're like oh okay yeah like that happened and they go check the camera and they're like oh yeah that did happen mm. and it's just a practice yeah, as thing. opposed to the other way around if you're watching film going oh hang on a second i didn't pick that up before yeah. in real time yeah and if you're running at velocities of 11 meters per second give or take you're you're exposed at that level mm. you, you can't hide in from any deficiency so watching no. that live is generally your best because you understand this, the gates mechanics the imbalances it's all there for you to look at so one of the things that you'll laugh at this, did you, you would have got back in your track days, the biomechanics reports. Did you get any of those? Yeah. And you'll laugh. And I think it's just because I've done them myself for so long. Often, I remember a couple of years ago, you know, some of the athletes I was coaching started getting the reports and I'd send them back and be like, these are wrong. And they'd be like, what do you mean? I was like, my athlete can't run that fast. And I'm telling you, they can't. <laughs> but I've done the analysis. This is what I got. And then they'd go and check it and they go, oh, yeah, actually, that, yeah, that must have been a calculation error on the spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> and I, like, I love when you're saying you're doing it yourself. Like, I think it gives you some of those skills that you need to be able to even recognize what the normal numbers should be and even a different sort of yeah. uh, you know, capabilities because that does vary, obviously, as you go up. And I know that particularly we had some issues with, have you used much of the AI systems like Viewmotion and things like that? Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we use that and it's getting better and better and better. But I remember when it first started and spat out some numbers, and I was like, these are all wrong. <laughs> and I was, you know, I sent them back to them. I said, guys, like I, I paid for this, but like, I don't know what to do with it because it's actually wrong. And they're like, what do you mean? And like, oh, maybe you didn't set it up properly. I was like, no, no, no. I think it's all set up properly. It's just wrong. Like these numbers don't match up. There was a, someone sent me a report, and it was of a very high level athlete, but it said that their athlete ran thirteen meters per second. <laughs> Usain Bolt, look out! Yeah, <laughs> which you know, for those listening, Usain Bolt's highest ever record was like twelve point four something. <laughs> and so they were like, "Yeah, I don't think this person ran thirteen <laughs> meters per second." <laughs> well, I think in the other beauty about that, and going back, transferring that from the coaching, if you understand what you're looking at. I mean, again, front on, side on, mechanics, whatever it may be, it makes you become a better coach in the gym mm. because you understand what you're actually coaching and what you're trying to transfer. Can you tell us a bit about attain. that? Because I think that that's something that for the longest time there, and I think it's one of the cool things that's changing in the strength and conditioning sports performance realm is 
there was there now isn't that separation. There are people going, okay, I see this out on the field, and I want to be able to change that here. Can you talk about your process with that? Yeah, and I guess I can talk it from a cricketing point of view. Yeah, I well, well, we may as well get into that from for a cricketing point of view, and we'll talk about some of the nuances. But what does yeah, what does it take to prepare a cricketer, and what are you looking at on the field that, that you can then start to transfer to the gym? Yeah, and it's a completely a multi. That's a loaded question. Course, yeah. I could probably spend hours talking about Go it. Go for it. Make I think time. in terms of where I've really transitioned from over my professional journey is, yes, there's going to be differences between the certain position a cricketer plays and what that looks like from their physical requirements. But fundamentally, you still want to program for the person sitting in front of you. Mm. And the more you can understand about that individual, that kind of helps initially determine the program from there on in. Mm. Um Cricket's unique in a sense that it's a very school based yeah. sport. So you can't you can't turn an athlete into a cricketer. Yeah. Um, but you can make a cricketer a more lot athletic. more athletic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of and course. which enhances their game. Um, and it makes them more robust, it makes them more dynamic, and it makes them be better for longer. I think that's a difference. So the beauty of that is you've got a young cricketer who steps into their professional world and it's about understanding the background, where they've come from, what's their capacity at that point in time. Uh, in cricket, there's so many different levels you can actually play in different formats. Yeah. So in conversations that's, with players. That's yeah. one of the things that changed probably throughout your career, didn't have how much people were playing 2020, the different variations on the game. You know, even this weird thing that's happened now where there's people who don't even venture towards test cricket. They just stay in the, the short form game of the games. Not at all. And the physical program is based on the individuals who are purely T20 cricketers are different to those who are playing the longer format, the four-day and five-day cricket, being first-class cricket or what, test what, match What's cricket. the difference, like, explain to people and even for us who are not super well-versed in cricket, what, what's the big difference in terms of their preparation? Well, you talk about, and I'll regress that and looking at someone's career and their projections and how to build someone up from, say, a 19-year-old or a 20-year-old first-year contracted professional cricketer all the way through to your international player at the age of 30. Yep. And we've got, again, cricket is so unique in terms of, if you're just playing your local cricket, the amount of game days you play, you might play one game day a week, mm. every seven-day period. If you then progress and you become at state-level cricket and you become a second 11 player, so that in the reserves, I guess from a football terms terminology, uh, you're only playing, in terms of your game days, you might play now on average two days a week. If you progress to a state cricketer, you're playing up to five game days a week. If you progress to international, you're doing those same days but you're doing it for a longer period over a 12-month calendar. Mm. So you could therefore argue that being a club-level cricketer doesn't really prepare you to being, say, a second 11 cricketer, and that doesn't really prepare you to be first-class cricketer being a state-level cricketer. Yeah. And how does that then prepare you for the demands of international cricket? So there's always a model that you're building towards. And this is where I think cricket being, a, again, a skill-dominant game, and then you got from a physical preparation or performance management perspective, the beauty of it is you can afford to take your time. Yeah. Knowing that someone's athletic two-game time trial doesn't necessarily determine in the short term their success rate. Yes, it might help them, but it doesn't mean they're going to get more wickets instantly from there on no. in. So you can train them to be progress their career. If we've got a young fast bowler coming through the ranks, and again, something we do look at from a bowling load point of view, and we look at you know how many games they're used to, what's their, how many match deliveries have they bowled across their previous three years, and what's our trajectory and what's our projections for the year on? We know if they progress over X amount, then the chances of them sustaining an injury, we'll touch on that yeah. a, bit more, a, bit more, a bit later, I feel like. Yeah, of course. But you kind of, you progress, you progress, you progress, you progress over the years and the progressive overload theories come into play. Um, how, how much profiling are you doing on those players when they come in to work out where their capacity is? You know, you mentioned something like their bowling loads and are you going and seeking out three years of data to say like how much how much bowling have you done over this last three years? You're averaging, you know, how many overs a week across this fifty two week period? And then are you projecting forward and saying, Okay, we think this year you'll be able to do X, then, you know, year two Y, then year three, you know, Z. Yeah. And we know these days if due to the pathway system that Victorian cricket have currently in place that we can now track those specified players from an early as the age of 16. Really? Okay. And so you can, get that data? We can view that and look at their match balls. And it's also available online okay. through multiple sources. So you can track that. And Cricket Australia do such a good job with their research around injury prevalence, in particular with lumbar stress fractures for fast bowlers, mm. and what that looks like and what predisposes a fast bowler to more likely being injured mm. in that space. So 
we know that in, our open, in conversation with coaches, if they have a 100% year-on-year spike in match deliveries, we know the likelihood of them breaking down at some point with a stress-related injury is significantly going to increase. Of course, yeah. So what does that then look like? So we can have data. What is the most? John, you've just become contracted. We know your two years, your match deliveries have been this and that and this amount. Um, your match days has been this. We forecast you to be playing this many games in the next 12 months. But yes, that's over an annual base. We also know how much the most density you've bowled in a three-month period, in a one-month period, and a one-week period. So we can then track that accordingly. So the question, the question yeah. I have for you then is, how does that interplay with the coach and with the captain, who obviously does a lot of the on-field coaching? When you've got all this data, are they listening in in meetings, saying, "Yeah, yeah, like that makes sense." So you want me to bowl them for this long in this spell? Then uh, you know the maximum number of overs that we're going to do is about this for this person. Is that how it works, or sometimes they just not listen to anything you say? No, the <laughs> engagement level is very high these okay. days. And the, the kind of the respect and the knowledge and what you're trying to attain because the data is all there and yep. you are trying to build these individuals to be international level players. Mm-hmm. So the minute you're kind of working with the players in that level, the coaches understand this and the data speaks for itself. Mm-hmm. As long as there's a plan in place and there's a bit of give and take, obviously. Of course, yeah, yeah. But and, and over here and over there is not going to be the yeah. difference. And but... once a player steps over the line to play, it's generally to the captain, unless there's some real medical underlying issues in play, and then it's over to whatever the captain thinks is best for that team to win, and, and the captain will be aware of what's around the corner at the same time. In terms of some of those different groups, can you talk to the actual physical preparation that you're looking at? You know, and you might want to de- develop them into the different categories. You know, you got your fast bowlers, you've got primarily, you know, people who are batsmen, and then you've got, you know, all, some all rounders, and you might have, say, slow bowlers. How different is their physical preparation? Yeah, it is quite different. Um, and do you segment them out quite a bit when you do that? It is, and it comes down to also understanding fundamentally what your kind of long term goals are with each individual. And what's on the scheduling forecasting head, what's around the corner. Mm. Um, if we do have someone who's preparing to play your four day cricket and depends how long rest are coming off between games, what was their bowling workloads? In a cricket space, you need to be very reactive to the data. It's not in the football codes where you can predict within probably 10% what someone's output's going to be. Mm. Cricket, we don't know how long the da- game's going to go for, how many yeah, overs true. they'll bowl, what mm. days they'll bowl. Mm. And what that actually looked like in the context to the day's rest between the next match. Yeah, that's, an, that's a very, that's a very good point. You're, mm. You are, you know, at the whims of the play of the game. And you, you have very little understanding of that sometimes. You know, as you said, weather gets called off for rain delays or, you know, you lose the toss and all of a sudden you expect it to be batting but yeah. you're bowling. Yeah. Well, and then uh, players, will have, okay. like, well, players will have their high-speed metrics and frequency rates so that they'll try to attain. But again, that'll be dependent on how many high-speed meterage or efforts actually gained in the previous match. Mm. Did a batsman only bat for, say, 20 minutes across one or two winnings? Did they bat for six hours, which yeah. is actually quite possible? Yeah. With that in mind then too, with monitoring and um, applying training loads, if a game, for instance, is really short because you, your team does really well and you bowl them out really quickly, for instance... Do you then look at topping up their their amount of training that they do to maintain certain levels on a you know a week to week basis? In the form, it really does depend on the format. Mm, okay. This one in the longer format, not really. Mm. You'll have the the longer format is an identity training box, which means if it was a short one, it's a bit of a win. So it means you've actually got more energy to conserve for the back end of the tournament. Okay, which is a huge win. Yep. Um, whereas if it's say in a T twenty format. Sometimes you will, but it depends on what the rest days and what the travel schedules also look like. So sure. highly variable and individual, particularly around injury history as well, and where they're playing. Because we can get in the T20 format, you can get sometimes someone who's batting at number six and potentially an all rounder, but the game might not demand they bowl and they can just be full time fielders in the context of the match. Uh, but again, are they fielding on the ring? Are they fielding um, out of ring, in the ring? If they're just fielding in the ring, we know their high speed meter won't be as high. But if they're fielding on the boundary... Yeah, and they're chasing balls all day. They're chasing balls. So they're going to organically get their high-speed meters. So it is a real balance, and it's all about knowing the individual and where they're at, where you're trying to take them to. So it's a real sitting on the fence sort of answers that I'm kind of delivering here, I feel like. But it's also no, the more no. you know the person in front and what's coming up around the corner and where they're at and also where their threshold and capacity is, it allows you to make the decisions. I think that the interesting thing, and 
I probably haven't considered this for a while. You know, I haven't spoken to you about this kind of stuff for a period of time, but how much you're thinking about, as you said, the trajectory of that person through their career. I think that's an interesting and kind of cool part of the cricket journey because I know that for a long time you were involved with a lot of the discussions and even you did some work with the Australian teams as well, didn't you? With uh, Was it the seconds that you were working with? Yeah, Australia A for a tour of the UK. Yeah. yeah. But I know that you're in, you were in constant uh, communication of like this person's on the pathway even though they're not in necessarily the Australian team yet, but we think they're going to end up in – t20 squad or and it was all about like okay what are you doing in terms of developing that person for this long term i think that's an interesting and maybe different approach um is that something that you initially thought was going to be part of what you did or did it just evolve into this thing that as you said the pathways are so clear now with cricket i think it naturally evolved and almost rounding back to the start of the conversation coming from a track and field background where i feel like the strength of track and field as a whole is it's planning it's periodized mm. um they're very advanced and have been for a long time and mm. team sports eventually do catch on in that aspect um but i think if you go back to then the bowling you're always thinking what's around the corner when's the high period of workload when the low periods of workload and you're planning so under for example if you talk about again the bowlers you know if you're a club cricketer we talk about match deliveries only uh, club cricketers going to bowl between 800 to 1,000 match deliveries across the season. If you're a first class or a second 11 cricketer, so like a reserves team, you're going to bowl around 2,000 match deliveries, so it's double. Yeah. If you go to being a state level cricketer, you're going to bowl around 3,000 match deliveries. That's another year. If you, if you then go international cricket, you're going to bowl around 4,000, 4, 4,500 deliveries across the year. So it's about progressing, progressing, progressing. You can't expect one person to skip three levels and expect them to be able to sustain that. For a period of time it's not realistic but no. end up in the medical room unfortunately so that's the conversations that are probably happening are happening and is that most of your management seems to be around bowling is that a, a big part of the injury stuff or the do you tend to see the other things that seem to be like a consistent as well with injuries yeah as far as time away from cricket it is your lumbar stress fractures yeah. are your longest and that Saying that the most uh, occurring soft tissue was still the hamstring. So, very yeah. similar to what the football code yeah, yeah. in that space. So, it is still, you know, hamstring injuries are the most prevalent in Australian cricket. Yeah. Uh, and then the introductory of T20 cricket being, again, it's a faster game. There's more high intensity efforts, there's more high speed running in a higher density period of time. Uh, and you've got your sleep deprivation and your higher travel, which compounds across tournament mode cricket. Mm. So, hamstring and soft tissue increase in and around a T20 tournament. Yeah. So it's about preparing cricketers for that leading into a T20 tournament whilst you might be in a four-day, five-day format mode, but you know their next tournament after that is T20 format. If they go into that format without having any high-speed metrics under their belt, the chance of them sustaining a soft tissue injury is going, going to increase. Up. So you yeah. need to top up their load sometimes, back to your other question, mm. around, well, this is around the corner. We need to you know, think about the T20 format let's do some more high speed run because you know you haven't attained that for a period of time you need to have a good capacity and a frequency to sustain the demands of what's around the corner mm. yeah i think the as i said I, I think that there's so much that goes into the cricket stuff and i think that's what makes it interesting if you're happy to like do you want to take us through a little bit around the lumbar stress fractures i would say that you probably got you know a lot of experience dealing with it what's the process that you go about rehabilitating and being part of that you know conversation with the docs physios yourself as the high performance manager what's that process like with someone who ends up does end up having a stress fracture and i might even ask you as well to explain can you maybe talk about some of those biomechanical features that i know that you guys are aware of with say certain bowling actions and things like that that maybe contribute and then you know what the process is if someone does end up developing you know a lumbar stress fracture yeah, to all the medical experts listening, my apologies if I don't have the terminology <laughs> on point here. Um, but certainly it's a collaborative team effort. And, you know, our chief doctor, um, I'm using current tense here, I should also preface I'm no longer working at Cricket Victoria. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the team doctor is going to look at the scans and there's going to be dialogue across the physiotherapist and the team doctor, uh, the extent of the stress fracture and the different levels, I suppose. Yeah. And then... I guess kind of as a strength and conditioning coach where my role comes in is looking at the load management and understanding, okay, uh, Cricket Australia do a great job and release their injury prevalence data on an annual basis and have done so much research into the why behind stress fractures. So 
understanding now with the program, what was their bowling frequency, what was a year-on-year bowling workloads, and what is their technical? So involving the coaches are pivotal to this, and we mm-hmm. look at it, um, counter rotation, their hips and shoulders. Um, is that at a dangerous level? The more counter rotation might lead to a you know faster delivery, but equally lead to more load and your body's in a more you, vulnerable. Position. Are you assessing that a hell of a lot when they come into the program, looking at that counter rotation? Is it something that you you try and work on? Go, you know, you're talking to the technical coaches, like cricket coaches, going, and the medical staff are thinking, like, okay, as you said, they bowl fast, but that looks really risky. Yeah, the bowling coaches do a fantastic job of that, and they do. All of our identified players, they will go and have a 3D analysis. Mm. Um, and you do get that report to get qualitative or quantitative. Talk, yeah. Talking even to us, because you know, I'm no expert in bowling and, and our listeners, what are the key things that if you're out in the field and you're working, say, at a lo- lower level, like what are you looking for in someone who you think is maybe more high risk? It's probably more growth okay. is a big one, your peak high velocity. And you're looking at also bowling workloads and your frequency of your bowl. Okay, when you say so, frequency, you mean how many times you bowl a week? How many times per week. Yeah. So we know that a young aspiring cricketer is more vulnerable to sustaining a stress fracture if they're bowling more than three days a week. Okay. If they're bowling on repetitive days, so back-to-back days of bowling in a match environment. So like Saturday, Sunday sort of thing? Saturday, Sunday, they're also more vulnerable to sustaining a stress fracture. Yeah, okay. Um, so it's about putting in the place um, different strategies and seeing as these cricketers develop through the ranks, they start forming rep teams with understanding does each individual need to actually be bowling, assuming they're a pace bowler here? Mm, yeah. Do they need to be bowling every single session they attend across the different teams they represent across the summer season? Yeah. Um, which can be a hard one for both, you know, coaches to understand and grasp that at that yeah, level. At that lower level of participation. Because yeah. if you've got your athlete there, this makes my training session a lot easier to facilitate. And you're here with us, why aren't you training mm. with, with the rest of your teammates? Yeah. Yeah. Is that, is, so are you, is, the training load much more important than the mechanics of the movement as a general rule? Early days, if you can get that right, mm. yes. Yeah, you certainly can. Um, yeah. And then from the mechanics, you will start to – you'll be identified as a key player early within each state system around the country. Mm. And they will then – if you are a player of interest in that pathway space, they will take you aside and help work with your mechanics. Yes. So they will be ticking over in the background. but. No one we can control as kind of, you know, strength and conditioning practitioners or high performance coaches is quite simply your workload management. Mm -hmm. And there's technology available now where you can start to track their workloads and help be more prescriptive of their workloads. Mm -hmm. So actually just in terms of the structure of Cricket Australia, it's very much a centralised model then. Like you have Cricket Australia and they basically monitor all the different levels. Yeah, because it just seems like that's such a better way to be able to then allow that follow through from step to step as opposed to decentralized models where you have you know competing interests or a lack of communication between going from one step to the next yeah and cricket australia do a great job that Mm -hmm. again the the one platform the athlete management system that all of australian cricket lives on is from the australian men's and women's teams all the way through to under 15s Mm -hmm. and everyone's got the same system same platform and the same database Mm -hmm. and all your information is available uh, one-stop shops. So. Well, with that in mind, in terms of injury prevalence, has there been a change in the the prevalence or rates of, say, stress fractures or stress reactions in cricketers over the last ten years? Um, well, that data hasn't really been collected and analysed. It certainly has been. It kind of ebbs and flows hmm. throughout the journey. I can only speak as well amongst my journey with the Victorian cricket team, and there certainly was a lot more stress fractures in the early years, hmm. and then as more research got announced and more technology became available and the level of conversation certainly has did increase over the years um that the levels did decrease significantly Mm. and like what was the 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 change in nuance was it really about the training loads and really nailing down and understanding things like frequency and development through the stages yeah 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 frequency was a big one for us Mm. um and it really did change how often in a bowling preparation period leading into a season and from a injury return to play perspective how frequently these guys were bowling mm. and when they did bowl um, the use of gp using gps technology uh, through catapult um, they can now got this kind of detection system where you can detect the delivery and it gives you a quantifiable load per delivery mm. and it's based on the assumption that no two deliveries are of the same load yes um, so what um, i was able to do in my time at cricket victoria was able to differentiate okay Again, here's a pace bowler. What run-up velocity 
equate to what relative match game load does mm. this equate to? If you're bowling at this velocity, this ball speed, what relative percentage is that to your maximum? So it could be 70%. And how do we then progress your, again, return to play or your kind of pre-season preparation to be 100% come game day? So we can quantify that as well. And that's been the biggest difference is understanding that and the level of conversation um, and the trust from the coaching unit saying, well, the goal is to get these guys right for the season. Um, and we did a pretty good job collectively of having a near 100% availability rate, mm. um, which was you know really good. But again, it's a huge team effort to, to achieve that and a lot of trust across multiple different departments to achieve that as well. You know, with cricket being a very skill-dominant sport, what is the attitude towards people's development of athletic attributes? Is, it, is there less of an emphasis put on it because they're really focused on their skill? And, and probably another question I had extending on that is because do you see that the athletic capacity is a differentiating, differentiating factor between someone's level of performance and what level they reach? Yeah, I certainly think a cricket is a undervalued in terms of their athletic prowess. Mm. I think, uh, like, just to give you some context with that, Jack, I remember, you know, a few times I was lucky enough, Adrian allowed me to come in and have a look at what, you know, he was doing with some of his work. And I think one of the things that is very, very visible is the athleticism of cricketers has gone through the roof, particularly mm. with 2020. Mm. Um, and now you would be surprised if there weren't people in there that were particularly impressive athletes yes okay um like i I remember seeing some of the gym sessions you're like these guys are very good athletes um and i think even too just i think the thing that probably changed that as well is the size of you know money that's in cricket and the contracts there's no incentive not to be looking after your athletic development as well as obviously your cricketing skills Mm. you know like the opportunity's there if you want to take it so you're going to seek out those opportunities and yeah i think that was something that was noticeable to me just having a small amount of context in my interactions with adrian and just seeing these guys actually like okay these guys are pretty impressive but your greatest commodity is your body Mm. yeah with franchise cricket around the world these days one injury can mean a potentially million dollar contract getting ripped up yeah Um, on the spot yeah so there's enough incentive right there i guess isn't there it's an easy conversation (laughs) um and these days, a lot of coaches, you know, they want a minimum of a two-dimensional player. So I think gone are the days where you can just be an exceptional batter and be a poor fielder or an exceptional bowler and a poor fielder. These days, particularly in T20, T20 cricket, you need to be a good fielder. And if it comes down to a selection between you and I who might be of a similar skill set and a similar level of capabilities, but you're a significantly better fielder, you're going to save more runs in the field, you're going to get the nod nine out of ten times. Um, and I think players understand that's so competitive for cricket and they want to be available and put their best foot forward for selection, knowing that franchise cricket is always around the corner and the money you know, up for grabs and international representation. How did that, so, how did that change? Because like that basically all came online while you were there, right? Because it was, it was IPL and, and obviously we, Big Bash, that started after you had already been with Cricket Victoria, correct? Yeah, correct. So I did the first 10 years with the Melbourne Stars and most recently did one year with the San Francisco Unicorns, a mm-hmm. new startup franchise in America. Yeah, very cool. How's that taking off in the s- cricket in the States? Well, they just finished their second year in the World oh, Cup right. and it, they're building new stadiums now, so it's, it's building very quickly. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah. What was your, like, what are your observations of that? How did it change the landscape of cricket? It changed it. Again, the level of conversation was certainly different. Um, it certainly was a high adaptation period across all different levels from coaches and players and players understanding that their bodies are highly important to them to succeed and what is best for them might not always sometimes be best for the team point of view. And it's under striking that balance of what that is. Um, and it certainly early days caused a few hard conversations. What, what, kind um, of, what kind of issues was it bringing up? Well, the prime example would be the riches of the Indian Premier League, which yeah. is now end of March and early April. It also coincides, if you're a first-class cricketer, with the sh- and if your team makes shield. the final, yeah. some players are not available to play the final, which is quite difficult because there's a lot of uh, emotional connection and, and players would probably, 
honestly prefer to play with their friends in first class cricket. But mm. how do you turn down a potential million dollars? Mm. Yeah. And that sets them and their family up for life. Mm. So, yeah, very difficult. And players are more understanding now of what people go through because of this and the more open conversation. So, it's a very different landscape, isn't it? It really, it, it really, the cricket world is very different. Do you, what do you see? And this is you maybe not putting on your professional hat, but even just your personal opinion and having some context. Where do you sit on the whole debate of, you know, things like test cricket and 2020 and what that even now means for, you know, one day cricket? What's your observation of all of that? And what's your, you know, even just your personal position on it? Are you a fan of, you know, the major shift or are you a traditionalist who likes? No, I actually think it's uh, exciting and because, and I'll, We'll put my strength and conditioning on it. You're so emotionally invested into helping these individuals achieve their goals. And in this case, their goals are high honours from a cricket point of view, and that's going to vary. And if someone's goal is to be the T20, that's fine. But Mm. there's more opportunity in today's cricket than what there was 20 years ago. So more opportunities, to me, is to me that's a win across the board. So more people are now getting exposed. They're travelling the world. They're getting Mm. exposed, whether it be from an Australian perspective or a shorter format franchise perspective. The opportunities and learning that they're developing accelerates it tenfold. Mm. So I think it's great. I think it's exciting. And in return, it again, it's the level of engagement and conversation from a physical point of view. It's it's exciting. How do I get better? How do I do this? How do I do that? Can you help me here? Can you help me there? Uh, as opposed to when I first started, the conversation was me trying to generate buy-in into the strength and conditioning mm. department. Yeah. Whereas now it's complete other way. Yeah. It's, yeah. They're trying to work out where to get better. Yeah. It seems like now these days some of the players, uh, and actually you might be able to answer this, are they often making that choice that they want to stay at one end of the spectrum, you know, like long form or short form? Or is it actually being directed, you know, say by Cricket Australia saying like, this is kind of where we have you. We think that you should put your efforts into playing you know, short form or long form? I think every player's got a different answer to that. It really does depend on the player and the skill set and what they can bring in both kind of a domestic level and an international level. Mm -hmm. Um, So it is a multifaceted answer, to be fair. Yeah, of course. Um, But I do think, again, this is more opportunity now and what that looks like. And sometimes the scheduling, internationally scheduling, can lend itself to a certain direction. So if you do happen to excel in the T20 format, it doesn't mean you don't want to be a test player, but if you're getting contracts to represent all these different franchises, that's where you go. Mm. But you just then lose the opportunity to showcase your talent across a longer format. Yes, yeah. And that's not by means of not wanting to do that or excel in that. Because a lot of, of most players Yeah, they do. want to play test cricket, for instance. But some yeah. just don't get the opportunity just the way things pan out. Mm. So yeah, it's a difficult one. We're going to shift to a little bit into more general high-performance coaching. and. You know, you've spoken a lot about technology and you've obviously used it a hell of a lot. What do you see, uh, you know, the benefits to that? And I think you've already spoken about some of them. And then, you know, on the flip side of that, what do you think are some of the downsides of this huge integration of technology into high-performance coaching? Don't get to use Microsoft Paint as much these yeah. days, I guess. <laughs> they may still exist. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. Uh, um, Media players definitely yeah. don't around anymore, that's for sure. <laughs> Uh, what a shame. But uh, I think it's, again, working from the GPS units, um, spending a lot of time investing in looking at data in that. I think they have really excelled the level of preparation and analysis they can dig in now um, into the game of cricket, uh, not just your GPS metrics in terms of understanding the, the demands and the needs from a training program and the you know tournament readiness or a game readiness level, but also from a bowling point of view and monitoring those bowling workloads. And being able to really ascertain and talk to coaches on a higher level around, uh, all right, player X needs to bowl between this level and this level and bowl this much and this much in his preparation period towards the season. Mm. And being able to objectively say, uh, looking at data, you know, if you are bowling at 118 kilometres an hour, we know that equates to 80% of your normal workload so stick within that and then next we're going to progress that to 85 percent. the next week we progress that to 90 yeah. percent. so you, the level of conversation then you're detailing that with the players on that do you think that your comfort with that any of it came from the track background because it's something as a track coach that you you basically do all the time 
you know, like you're always working across, you know, a preseason. You're not starting people at 100%. Oh. You know, you're going, okay, this phase, I'm happy for them to be running at this. And you're setting times for them saying, they'll go faster than this, even though I know you can because we want to do X amount of volume and then we're going to build that up and we'll go from there and it's going to get a bit faster. It's a very natural inclination, but I would, was that something that was very unnatural for, say, cricket coaches to think like, oh, yeah, I don't want my bowlers bowling flat out from the start of preseason until the end of preseason? I think it was initially, particularly maybe during a preseason training phase as well in terms of taking your track and field loading principles into account, mm-hmm. almost like your Charlie Francis to some extent, your high load, your low load, your medium workload days, your tempo days. When do you attack intensity? When do you not attack intensity across the week? Mm. Uh, and then delivering that to coaches, that took a number. Is that a lot of education that you were having to do? It really is. And then over time, you build trust, um, which is fan- It did work yeah. over time, which was fantastic. And, and then the level of conversation goes, well, hold on. So on my high loading days, you know, this is, these are the days from a skills point of view. These are the days that bowlers are going to be bowling. These are the days we're going to hit our high speed metrics. These are our high loading days in the gym where we look at our, you know, central versus peripheral fatigue mechanisms. I want to hit my central fatigue mechanism on this high loading day. Mm. Um, what does that actually look like? And then the, the generally question you will get, oh, can we shift that to this day because something else wants to work this day? But then that then flips the whole loading calendar on its head. Mm. Um, and it's about understanding the why behind it. And trying to communicate that the best you possibly can. Yeah. And what entailed best thing about cricket when you are in a deload period, that there's still so many things a cricketer can be doing to better themselves as cricketers. Mm. They can still hit in the nets, yes. standing there and feeding balls. They can still work on their catching. They can still work on their throwing. There's so many stationary activities. And that's the good thing about a very highly skill based sport is the skills t- typically, from a physical standpoint, are not a huge amount of loading. Yeah. And this is where, again, the communication that, yes, we're not going to invest time into this element of your physical preparation, whether that be from a high workload bowling element or high-speed running or high tonnage in the gym. But instead, we're going to invest in these other areas mm-hmm. from you, but from a physical point of view or mental point of view, from a skill readiness point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's always something the players are aware of and the coaches are aware from the scheduling element. Yep, this is your time. We're not, never going to say no to someone hitting more balls than the net. Yeah. Um, they can do that as much as you think is necessary as a batting coach. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I think as I said, like it, it sounds like the integration of technology was overall very positive and has continued to be positive for cricket. Are there any things that you think it actually detracts from? Yeah, I think and this is just again my personal philosophy on this one. These days technology you can really and smartwatches are big on this, and you can really analyze and follow someone twenty four seven. But when you're trying to talk about developing elite athletes, I'm talking even more from a cricketing perspective here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're trying to develop thinking athletes. Yes. Um, critically thinking athletes in the heat in the moment, they've got to think for themselves on their feet. So how do we then expect an individual to critically independently think in the heat of the moment when outside of a playing field, we're dictating to them what they should and when they should be doing it 24-7? Mm. Um, and that's, that's what I'm mindful. an interesting idea, isn't it? Yes, we want to monitor you, and we do. We'll do that accordingly. But at the same time, you're an adult. You're a human. You need to make adult decisions for yourself, mm. and you need to understand what's best and at that moment in time, what's best for you to perform, whatever that may be, in an everyday life perspective. And if you make mistakes, there's nothing wrong with someone making mistakes. Making mistakes, it creates the best learning. Mm. And then you understand someone's kind of behavioral patterns. Do they, has a learning occurred? Has it not occurred? Um, so I think it's, again, being a well-rounded athlete is not just about the not individuals, they're not robotics. So it's about, all right, boom, thinking for themselves. Are they making the right decision? What, what processes did you put in place to allow that to happen? You know, and this is maybe a more general question, but are you, are you talking to the coaches of like, okay, we're not going to intervene there because we don't actually want to take away that opportunity for, as you said, for them to learn and make that decision? Is that something that you guys were discussing and saying, like, we've got all this data, but I'm not necessarily going to talk to them about it because I need them to make a decision based off what they're reporting and how they're feeling and what they're going to do about it? I think this is also the art of coaching. Yeah, it is, yeah. Understanding each individual and from a personality point of view and how they actually work. Some people will be highly, and some athletes are highly analytical, so the more numbers and data you throw at them, 
does it actually, do they walk out of that room or that conversation worse off? Are you confusing them? Mm. Sometimes ignorance is bliss from an athlete's point of view, or some athletes would love to know the information, need to use the information, and it makes them better and makes them feel more in control of certain situations. Yeah. So then we feed them that information. But it also, again, from a high performance unit, it depends with the data saying there could be a potential negative or potential injury or something could go wrong around the corner. What is that level? What's that fall, the extent of the fall? And do we need to actually have that conversation or not? And that's, again, highly variable on what the data is saying. What are we doing? Do we communicate it? So, In terms of the overall development of athletes, and this is more talking in generalities, what are some of the things, and you can use the cricket examples because I know it's, it's where you've drawn a lot of your professional experience, but how much growth do you see in some of these guys across their career? If you were to talk about, say, those loads, you know, you mentioned the change from 1,000 balls a year to 4,500. Is that a kind of typical thing that you see across lots of different domains of their performance? Like you're seeing like a four or five fold improvement in their capacity, if that, if that makes sense? Yeah, very much. And again, we look at their workloads um, and the old Gabbett data, the acute chronic workloads. And yeah, we had Tim on actually. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> um, it was interesting because you said, you know, we published some of this stuff and it was very much based on, you know, we're seeing things. We thought, okay, we'll publish some of this. And then it, you didn't use the right statistics and you didn't. And he's like, Fuck off! Like, literally, we're we're putting trying, out ideas. We're putting yeah. out ideas. We're trying to help people from what we're observing, and you know, we're trying to collect good stuff. Mm. And then people are nitpicking on you know statistical analysis and oh. stuff. And well, it's like, you know, those people aren't coaches when that happens. And that was actually the founding was uh, <laughs> Peter Blanche was the other one who did some work. Yeah, he did. Um, yeah. In study with creators looking at pace bowls and relating that back to injury prevalence as well. And that was a huge stepping stone in the level of conversations we were having and mm. helped us program accordingly. So um, you did great work for everyone. Mm. You know, a, a yeah. question I had for you, and this is probably more just from your observations in your working in cricket, is do you see certain characteristics that divide the people who manage to take that next step to becoming, um, you know, representing international teams? as opposed to not getting there? Do you see particular traits or characteristics in the people who do make it that next step? Um, I think from a physical point of view, we have seen the physical traits and the commonalities between elite, mm. uh, particularly in the male cricket space. We do know that the most of the best fast bowlers in the world, generally they're you know, in the isometric mid pool data from absolute values. They're hitting anywhere between 4,000 and 5,500 newtons on that um they're highly explosive their counter movement jump is north of 60 or north of 65 um with over 70 is also now getting more common hmm. um so they're able to jump and their aerobic capacity hmm. is getting highly elite as well so hitting 2k time trial markers in around 6 30 or seven minutes hmm. um and someone you know low six minutes is also these days can be quite normal across australian cricket so it's interesting to notice like some of those physical attributes then too and the importance of the athletic capacity then yeah, yeah. and it certainly helps and i think gone are the days with your old school cricketer mm. um but you know and i look at some people who like to comment on, on you know an old picture you know dave Warner or aaron finch um they might not be you know they might look like they're not going to go run a marathon but they're actually both of them and Dave Warner's physical investment as his career progressed was actually outstanding. He's completely physically speaking, he's transformed. Um, but, you know, Aaron Finch, because I worked so closely with him over his career, given he's a Victorian player, um, his power attributes, his speed, his counter movement jump um, were just through the roof. Hmm. It was amongst the best in Australian cricket. Hmm. Um, his aerobic capacity was okay. Certainly not the, great, not the greatest from a 2 go time trial point of view, but he was excellent. Hmm. It, and he's one characteristic, and that made him the cricketer that he was. So from a physical training point of view, that's what makes him the cricketer. We don't want to train that out of you. We want to, our training physical program, we're going to keep this power and maximise your power the best we can, enhance your strength. Yeah. Yeah. As an almost an extension to that, you know, and it delves into more of the coaching space, but what, what do you see or do you see that there are areas of, say, high-performance coaching that lend themselves to other areas of, you know, professional world i think there is and particularly around um, a lot around the planning mm. and the understanding um the level of conversation the elite sporting world is so day-to-day 
uh, a lot changes in within 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And you've really got to be have clarity in your thought process and understanding of the direction across different levels of your individual and from your team perspective. Um, you need to understand the direction you're going. You need to understand how you're going to get there. And you need to be agile in your approach in terms of, well, initially this was meant to be nominated for this sort of day, but due to some unforeseen circumstances, this is now going to change. How can I be shifting and how can I evolve? Do you, do you think that's something that good high-performance coaches are good at is, you know, under high-pressure situations, being able to make lots of changes and still have clarity? Is that, is that something that you've noticed across the best performers that you've had I interaction think, with? I think so too. And, and the other level to that is actually how to having the deep, hard conversations mm. um, and understanding and trying to communicate with someone through the disappointment and trying to go on that emotional journey. Again, it's very common. As kind of high performance coaches, you invest so much into their lives and understand that relationship and how to get the best out of individuals. And I think that's what's highly transferable. Okay. Do you, on that, what do you like? You've obviously worked in a very professional setting, and it's a conversation that I've had with a number of other coaches because obviously, for me, I coach very much whilst you know it has this professional element to it, it's basically essentially a private coaching arrangement. So the relationships that I have with a lot of my athletes, over time, you end up becoming you know, quite friendly, quite close. And at times, it can be an interesting you know, like dynamic where I remember not that long ago, I had an athlete get quite annoyed with me because I was being really firm on him um, about some of his sort of behaviors towards training. And he said, you know, he was basically saying, well, you know, like I've got all this money in the bank from, you know, you know, it was something to do with being late, I think. And I was, you know, getting into about punctuality and he was saying like, well, you know, like I'm never late. And I said to him, yeah, but you're not going to start being late now. And he got really funny with me about it. Particularly because he felt like our relationship was actually very close. How do you see the interplay of that in a professional setting? Because even recently I had a conversation with some of the guys from a um an AFL club who was saying um that when you spend so much time with these guys sometimes when you do have to have a hard conversation where you have to be really strict on something it can be difficult because they they've almost changed their perception of who you are in that dynamic is that something that you were conscious of or something that you kind of have worked on and maybe you have some tips for us and even for me for how you actually tackle that kind of thing i but then I think it's actually easier to have a harder conversation if you've got a closer relationship to yeah. someone because assuming you've got that positive relationship, that individual will know there's such a high element of trust mm. um, and care and respect going two ways. And they'll, then they'll then understand when that conversation is in need to have that where it comes from. It comes from a place of I care for you, I want to look out for you, I want the best yeah. from you and the best for you and I firmly believe that this is the route. And Within that as well, these days when you have these conversations, it's the two-way conversation. It's not exactly, it's not a dictating conversation. No. And um, when I, when I, like I was, we were talking, I was specifically talking to the rehab coordinator and he was saying, you know, like when people are really comfortable around you, then all of a sudden you have to put the hat on when like they're actually quite injured and you're like, okay, you're going to be out for a bit. And they're like, oh, no, nah, no, nah, I'm, I'm okay. And they're like, you're not okay. Right? Like this is actually a significant injury. It's going to take some time. We're going to need to go down this path. You might need surgical input. You might need that. You know, it's obviously working with the doctor as well. He said it's been an interest. He's, he's young uh, or youngish, and he's sort of saying it's been interesting for him as he's gotten closer to the players, having to put that hat back on and be like, no, I'm being serious right now. Like, this is your process. We're not going to, we're not going to try and push this because we can't. Yeah. And I think to understand that. It's a team game. It's a journey. Mm. And us as practitioners were a part of the athlete's journey and we want to make them the best we possibly can and i really do believe that they understand that and we build that rapport that those conversations are a lot easier and they come from a place of love um Mm. and it is a highly team dynamic as well but the topic of lateness that's certainly my philosophy around that has certainly evolved Gone are the gone of the days where we're going to Kerford Kerford Road because one player turned up late and the whole team's got to get up at six in the morning in the middle of winter and spend 10 minutes in the ocean and 
And then one day I think someone came late to the late punishment session and then we ought to come back the next day and I thought, oh, no. So I'm not doing this anymore. I think in that change of philosophy, it was uh, back to treating your athletes like humans as opposed to robots came down that if someone is like, that's fine. People get caught in traffic. Things happen in life, but it's your power of your communication. Mm. And to, to us or to me, that's kind of a non-essential how you communicate and that's a real world attribute that you need to have in life. So if you can't communicate and saying, sorry, Modi, this happened, yeah. I'm going to be, for whatever reason, I'm going to be late. This is the reason why I'm fine. Yeah. Not a big deal. But rocking up late unannounced, that's rude. Yeah. It's not showing respect for their teammates, for you, for whoever. Yeah. Yeah. As I said, in terms of how that translates into other areas, it's been interesting because I've, I've found that I'm seeking out areas of high performance and elite behavior in other realms. And I won't lie, like I'm struggling to find other areas where people think in that kind of way. It seems to be only a few domains. And it does seem there are commonalities across those, but most people don't necessarily want to go into that kind of level of detail that you're talking about in terms of monitoring things or the level of professionality that's needed. Do you think that as time goes on, we're going to see more and more people who come from this high performance space end up in environments where they're leaders to actually try and drive some of that high performance practice? I think so. I think at the moment we're seeing certainly the old Olympic rollers seem to be going pretty well. Mm. Uh, I think if you look across the board, there are a lot of common domains and the kind of discipline, understanding, that strategic mindset that you do have at that elite level of sport, it's highly transferable to the business world. You just the why becomes a bit different. Mm. Might be a bottom dollar, it might be a different yeah. business values organisation as opposed to winning gold or winning a grand final, whatever it may be. So certainly highly transferable. I think we're already seeing that happen. Is this something that you would ever be interested in doing? I think so. It definitely will. Um, I know personally from my point of view, I just love helping people <laughs> <laughs> and whatever that looks like, so be it. So, um, and getting the best out of teams. And to me, that's just where all the passion comes in. You're going to get emotionally invested in understanding your weak points of team. You talk about behavioral, uh, behavioral science, understanding certain behaviors and the why behind the way people act at times. So, have you done extra, you know, study or you know, professional development in that area of understanding behavioral science or, or you know, the psychology behind it? Certainly, probably one of the greatest ones we did with our sports psychologist uh, Tony Glynn many years ago was we did the insights personality testing, and I think. Uh, just another personality testing that's out there, I guess. But uh, this one hit home to a lot of the squad and the way it was kind of rolled out and implemented across the whole team perspective was, un- was a highest level that I've come across in terms of it understood not only where did each individual sit on that pendulum, but it also... Can, went- you, can you give us a bit of it? I've, I've never heard of the insights testing. Yeah, so what is, what, how does it work? Uh, you've got four levels. You've got your kind of your blue category. Think of just like a pie you got your little blue quarter which is going to be which most strength and conditioning sports scientists come under that umbrella and what is now that? you What's think before you talk you're yeah. highly analytical uh you assess the situation before you act um and then you've got your green which is your high in empathy you know they uh highly emotional um they emotionally invest into a lot of situations and those around them uh you've got your red which is like your big chief and they're the they're generally going to be, you know, your team, the boss, the captain, and it's, you know, they're highly, here's how we're going to do it. Get around me, let's go. Uh, and then you've got your yellow, which is real extroverted sort of character who, you know, just um, you'll act upon and then you'll think later, um, get energy from other people, get energy from team environments or, you know, group dynamics. So it's about understanding kind of from a team training point of view, and we do a lot of our team training sessions, is making sure those dynamics are right. And understanding when you do have that level of conversation, uh, how to frame that conversation, depending on what you're about to say, because it does vary based on the personality type in front of you. So to me, that was uh, hugely influential in understanding how to frame those hard conversations, talking about programs. To the- yeah, I'm, I might ask you because you're here, because I'm very interested as well in what you mentioned before um, as part of this is in team, you know, developing teams and getting performance out of teams. Is were there things that you guys did together that really started to define exactly what you wanted, say, the Victorian team to look like? I know you obviously worked for the, the Melbourne Stars for a long time as well. You know, were you a part of a lot of that process too? And, and what is that, in your mind, what does that entail? Yeah, it certainly is. And again, this is a challenge of cricket that 
yes, there will be Victorian cricket team, but the Victorian cricket team only probably play together in its full capacity in terms of everyone being available who is contracted to play for Victoria. It might happen once a whole calendar year. Yeah. <laughs> because everyone's an international represent, representation, French, franchise representation. It really does happen. And people play overseas in candy cricket over in England mm. as well. So it's rare that you kind of get that whole team together in that one so comment. Is, so that makes it a challenge. Is there an ethos to, you know, and a culture to what the Victoria say the Victorian cricket team is? Or is that something that you said it's a challenge because there's so many moving parts and people are all over the place? It's a, certainly an evolving space. And when I first arrived at Victorian Cricket, there was a lot of senior players, a lot of hardened players who probably made from an old school system, I would dare say, and very direct line of communication, win at all cost sort of point of view. Um, and then towards my latter years at Victorian Cricket, it certainly shifted to the younger generation who didn't certainly connect with those old values and had a different way of going about their preparation and a different way of going about playing and a different way to go about winning. They didn't quite connect to that old methodology. Mm. Um, so there certainly was a shift towards, all right, here's the new breed coming through and the new breed are no longer the minority. They're now the majority. Yes. But yet we're hanging on to this old philosophies. But what can we learn from these old philosophies? Because that was the most successful period or in cricket. Yeah. So a lot was done very well. So it's a lot to learn from this. What, what was some of the ph- Can you talk about some of what some of those philosophies that at least in your mind what they were? Uh it was winning from all positions. So no matter what the so, state of the game was, we are always in a position to win and they always back not only themselves but their teammates to perform when it mattered most, to either dig them out of trouble or to do what it took to win uh, on the field. Was that something that naturally those players brought just because of who they were? Or was that something that was fostered within the team? And, you know, once it happens a few times, it starts to become, you know, well, we can win from anywhere. We've done it before. You know, was it, or was it something that you guys actually went out of your way to start instilling in them? No, no, you have the abilities, back each other, back yourself, go for it. Yeah, I think it was certainly that way instilled when I first started. And they just had complete faith and trust in their way of doing it. They knew if they just all did what they needed to individually do to get themselves ready and they were so talented as a group mm. that they would win. Mm. And they just believed that and had just never backed down from that belief that they would win every single time. And you said that changed as the younger crop came along. Were you able to maintain some of that belief or was that harder to do when some of the personnel changed because they maybe didn't have the exact same level of talent? It certainly, the belief was still there, but it was delivered differently. How, how was it different? I think just the level of communication and the methodology of communication certainly changed. Uh, maybe that's just a reflection of, again, the kind of new generation coming no, through. No, I, I, I realise I'm roasting you, but I, I kind of, I'm doing it because I've been thinking about this problem a lot. Because I do, I have the exact same observation that you have, which is that previous generations, and even I would say, you know, our age and older versus you know probably people who are under 30 now have very different belief systems in what they're capable of um and i don't i don't 100 percent understand why this is happening i have some ideas but the older generations i observe at least the successful ones had and had a mentality of if someone has done it before then I am capable of doing it, right? And it's not an arrogance thing. It's just like, it's possible. So why not, why not it be me? The younger generation have, and it's not all of them, but some of them have this thing of, they want evidence that they're going to achieve it before they've achieved it to then believe that they're going to do it. And it's this separation. And I've been thinking about this at a number of different levels and trying to work out, okay, can you start to input, you know, ideas to say, well, why can't that be you? You know, what do you have to see in your performance? How much improvement do you see need to see so that you can go, oh, that is possible there? And you have some of them that pop out and they just like they just believe they're gonna do it no matter what. And the ones that I find interesting with that is say for instance, they've had all the ability and they have been succeeding and then injury stops them and what happens at that point? And it's the conversation of, okay, well, do you still believe that you're this level of capability? Yeah, I do. So why are you acting as if you're not just because you've had, say, a significant injury? 
those are the conversations that I find really interesting in trying to see like, how do you help someone back on track with that? Because it's clear that they haven't lost ability. Um, but you know, they've, they've been dented a little bit psychologically because they've been injured for a period of time. So yeah, I'm interested to know. And it sounds like as I said, it's not necessarily something that is easily identifiable. That you're like we did this, but that there is that generational change and how you maintain those levels of belief. It's like almost like creative, creating learning experiences at yeah. every opportunity. What can we draw out of these experiences? And that's how do you lead a horse to water. Mm. Um, and I think these days you really need to change the way you do that. Whereas you can very tell someone, I felt like you could have directly, very explicitly tell yeah. someone <laughs> when I first started yeah. coaching. And they were okay with that. Now. It just won't fly. It'll just be in one ear, out the other, across the board. And that's generalizing, to be honest with yeah. you. And that's not everyone. No, it's not everyone. But yeah, um, that's just certainly different. But it's a fun challenge. It's a more engaging challenge. And I think that challenge, positive as that is, it makes you be stronger to what you're communicating. Mm. And you need to understand the why of what you're communicating because you're going to get challenged in return. Yeah. And to me, I like that. Yeah, well, I think that that's, uh, that's a strength of real high performance environments is that the conversations go in every direction. And there's... There's no hierarchy, even though people are put in positions of responsibility, there's no hierarchy in terms of who can communicate what and who can ask questions. And I think that that's hard to foster, um, you know, a particular, and I'm sure it probably was for you, when you've got lots of changing people, you know, because obviously when young people come in, they don't necessarily feel that they've got that trust yet to say, oh, well, Adrian, like, this is the program, but I don't think I can do that yet or whatever. You know, as they get older, I'm sure... And I even remember in the observations that I had with you with some of the players, the older ones, it's, it's a full-on conversation. I did this the other day. You know, you wanted, you know, we've got this plan. What do you think with this? Okay, let's try that. And let's, yeah. And that, I think, is a very, very different dynamic. But that's, as you said, just building that communication and trust. Um, the last thing that we ask most of our guests, and it's something that we obviously will ask you, is is there anything that you're looking at outside of maybe sports performance or your coaching that is really taking your interest and is taking up some of your curiosity in life? Because you're obviously a person who loves to explore things and learn um, and is interested and um, wants to know more. So is there anything that's kind of taken your fancy at the moment in terms of your intellectual Sort certainly, of yeah. Certainly enjoy the investment property world. Over okay. Years, so Very cool. <laughs> that's been enjoying listening to the debate around the negative gearing and what's around the corner. So, <laughs> what are you learning? <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I am learning that my retirement plans could change if the next <laughs> gearing. <laughs> so, we'll see how that pans out on a personal level. Um, but no, I certainly enjoy that. At the moment, I'm doing some um, teaching at Deakin University. So, thoroughly enjoying that education space at the moment and the challenges. That presents. And Is that always something that you're interested in doing? Education. Uh, I love. If you love coaching, I feel like us coaches is teaching. we're teachers. Yeah. So to me, it's wholly interchangeable in yeah. how you go about it. You've just got a group of group of people in front of you trying to connect with and break down barriers and help engage and develop along their journey. Mm. So to me, I'm really enjoying that and seeing similar challenges just in different played out differently, which has been great. Um, there's certainly something I am passionate about as well is for these up and coming strength and conditioning coaches or who want to work in the high performance world is how to utilize their time spent in their universities mm. and how to be kind of more efficient potentially. What, do, is, what are you observing and what, what do you sort of, what are the, maybe some general recommendations? Certainly a give? highly competitive field at the moment. It is, yeah. Um, certainly oversaturated. A lot of people with ambitions of working with the elite. Mm. Um, but what I've seen is getting that applied knowledge and understanding what is actually happening in that high performance world right now versus what you're getting taught in the university setting, which you need that fundamental knowledge, but understanding how to then apply your knowledge, theoretical knowledge with kind of your applied sciences and how it works in that team or individual environment as well. And understanding that the different ways you navigate certain situations, because that's, again, it's the art of coaching. Yeah. Um, so how do we help accelerate these students so that when they do come out with their degrees, um, they are potentially, they are ready to step into whatever high performance environment and they will have an impact or at least learn and be engaged in what's actually happening. How much of the course, courses, you know, you've been teaching in it is around coaching, you know, and like actually the art of coaching and that teaching side of it. Yeah, and that's, it is getting more, hmm. more and more pronounced now, which is, which is great. The gap is certainly getting more narrow, but 
I can speak on the other side of the coin, um, running the internship programs with the Victorian Cricket and having interviews and teaching, um, running workshops mm. for up and coming students. And it's interesting and watching it all play out. And you certainly see the theoretical components that are now happening right in front of them and just trying to connect the dots. And mm. how do we accelerate that on a more broader level? Mm. Adrian? Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come and chat with us. It's been a pleasure, gentlemen. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Make sure that you like and subscribe to all of our social media channels. And if you have any questions, as always, feel free to reach out out to us through our social channels.